Hello friends, uh, as you know we've been running a series on the 19th century fiction and particularly short fiction, the short story and uh, we have uh, by now covered uh, a few authors uh, with respect to the specific short stories that they wrote and uh, which became uh, in a part of our analysis and uh, for today's lecture we have uh, Professor Payal Nagpal who teaches English in uh, Yankee Devi Memorial College, Delhi University and uh, is, uh, has worked exclusively al almost on the 19th century area of uh, writing. Uh, but you know, the, this particular thing is uh, not just the 19th century, but the European uh, short story there. And uh, uh, good for us, uh, it's, it's a kind of a pioneer effort uh, that, that Professor Pal Nagpal will be uh, presenting uh, before you uh, in the form of a discussion on George Eliot's short story. Uh, I, I repeat again, George Eliot's short stories. He is not known for writing short stories, and even this was not a short story, uh, exactly speaking. But you know the way uh, Professor Pal Nagpal thought about it, and she consulted uh, different sources. She found that it was somewhere between the short story and the novel, and uh, very few people, in fact, are aware of uh, this particular text that uh, she will be talking about. Uh, so the first question that I would ask Professor Pal Nagpal is this only. Whether it's a short story, whether it's a novella, or whether it's a piece of fiction that cover, uh, touches both ends, what, what, what is your opinion about this? So, uh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Prakash, and uh, you raised some very, very interesting and pertinent questions about uh, uh, this uh, short story slash novella. Uh, when I read The Lifted Whale, and I was thinking about how we can actually talk about it, uh, you know, in this lecture, uh, it is uh, it is written in two chapters, so it can classify as a novella, it can classify as short fiction, but it is also if one looks at the length and the way in which a certain theme has been covered, mm -hmm. the essence is that of the short story. What do you mean by uh, essence? So essence <laughs> in the sense that you know there is a, there, there is a, a kind of plot that would be akin mm -hmm. not to the novel but to the uh, uh, short story mm -hmm. and uh, I think the lifted veil uh, carries that very well and uh, uh, if one reads criticism on the lifted veil then critics have responded to it uh, calling it uh, some have called it a novella and some have called it a story mm -hmm. so um, I think uh, uh, what's also very valuable here is that this is George Eliot who's experimenting I think with the form of fiction and seeing where she leads. The very, I find found it very interesting that it's written in the form of two chapters, that there's chapter one and then there's chapter two. But at the same time, as I said, if one actually were to read this, uh, you know, in totality, one would get the sense that yes, it can be called a story. So uh, one more question before you uh, begin the discussion. Uh, you know, George Eliot, uh, viewers, all of you know, but I, I still say George Eliot is not George Eliot. George Eliot actually is a woman yes. and she had to assume in the 19th century the name George Eliot and she was actually Mary Ann Evans. Uh, all of us know about it. But you know this might have been reflected uh, in, in this story also that it's a man-woman. It, it's, a, it's a woman who uh, assumes the identity of a man and, and presents her things from her point of view as a man or as a woman. So th th this, this problem, how do you sort it out? So uh, actually, it's it, there's there's a lot that's at work here. So you know, maybe uh, no simple answer to that one. But yes, uh, here we have a woman who adopts a male pseudonym of George Eliot, and the narrator here is a man. So this is a story that is written from the perspective of a male narrator, okay. and I think that also makes it uh, you know uh, so much more interesting for that reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see uh, so you know, do we call it some kind of a a confessional narrative, do we call it uh, um, a story that can be related to science fiction, do we call it a story that can be, uh, you know, that, that uh, leads to, uh, you know, unraveling of uh, the plot in some way. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a lot of things uh, that are uh, at work here. So uh, uh, one of the important things I think about the lifted whale is uh, we should keep the title in mind that, you know, there is a whale which means that something is hidden. And the whale is, uh, you know, like for the, towards the end, it says uh, the whale is finally lifted. So what is it that do we, what is it that we see once the whale is lifted? But um, 
you know to first uh, you know look at it and to contextualize it in in the sense of you know whether we classify this as short fiction as novella or a story so it, the the work uh, is very interesting for the craft uh, you know the whole process of writing i think by george eliot here and uh, the whole um, the fact that it's very layered uh, looking at it in the context of you know a woman writer with a male pseudonym choosing i think the element of choice is at work here choosing a male narrator uh, for this particular story so i'm going to in the course of this lecture refer to it as a story so uh, it's written in the first person this first person narration is by a man so which means that even though it is a first person narration it is not something that the writer has written and um, uh, the narrator is not the writer so to say but there is a very clear you know almost independent space that is given to the narrator now this particular story was uh, written in uh, and published around 1859 and uh, in uh, uh, blackwoods magazine to begin with and um, th this is also the time that adam bed and other novels are written and uh, so um, it's it's interesting how i think george eliot is uh, kind of you know thinking about the whole craft of writing which is why i find the classification of chapters in a story very interesting almost kind of working between a story and a novella so uh, also uh, you know how does one categorize this particular story so uh, if we if we look at the story the first person narrator uh, to just uh, sum up the story right at the beginning so there is a uh, you know uh, a person called uh, latimer and uh, uh, latimer uh, you know has these he's he's got these visions almost like he's uh, you know like a clairvoyant or uh, something he's got these visions and uh, he's able and those visions are compared then with the real uh, world and they turn out to be true and he has three very significant visions um, you know one is about uh, the city prague one is about uh, the fact that uh, he sees uh, mrs filmore and uh bertha uh you know uh, uh you know in a room and that too comes out uh, to be true and finally he sees uh, a vision to a, a, a of a time towards the end of his life where uh you know bertha and he are married and there is immense hatred on bertha's uh, face and he does not know how to deal with it so uh, the visions come out to be true and uh, towards the end of the story uh, you know he has very few friends latum has very few friends and one of the friends is charles munier who's uh, you know experimenting uh, you know conducting many experiments in science and physiology and um, uh, you know the in in the latum household uh, he's finally married to bertha uh, bertha's maid uh, you know uh, is not well and um, he wants to uh, charles wants to conduct an experiment uh, that once uh, she dies he says that she's not going to survive so once she dies he wants to you know kind of uh, uh, draw blood uh, from uh, you know do a kind of blood transfusion from his artery to uh, that of uh, you know uh, the house help and uh, she momentarily uh, you know uh, regains life only to uh, say uh, you know how uh, uh, bertha wanted to poison her husband that is latimer and it is at this point that the story ends so the veil is finally lifted and so on so this in a nutshell is what the story is about but here in this story it's not so much the the you know a, a summing up of the plot that is important but there are many many layers in this particular story which is why you know the uh, responses to this are from very different points of view does one call it science fiction does one call it sensational fiction is it about is it a confessional narrative that is latimer's is it about his clairvoyance is it about you know the whole victorian uh, struggle between science and morality uh, you know so a lot of questions are raised uh, by this particular story and the the story holds uh, immense value for this reason and as mentioned that george eliot manages in a sense you know the author and the narrator here are two very distinct uh, 
people even though it's as i said written in the first person so as uh, you know one of the critics gil uh, uh, gil ganlon uh, points out that this true too was generally associated uh, with women now here we also need to read the story from the point of view of gender that latimer is actually uh, projected as somebody who's effeminate and uh, you know the the whole idea of clairvoyance and holding seances was also generally associated a kind of uh, you know spiritualism and cult was associated with the women in a conventional stereotypical uh, uh, trope but here george eliot has quite reversed it and uh, here we see the woman as uh, you know assertive more powerful um, looked at from the point of view of you know a lot of the attributes that are uh, you know associated you know be it Uh, the moral attributes or the ethical attributes that are associated with the women are all reversed here and uh, the story in that sense then almost becomes i think quite uh, you know um, um, a reversal of expectations and quite an experiment i think at many levels so for instance to uh, you know begin with uh, just a very uh, you know important quotation from silly novels by lady novelists uh, written around 1856 where Uh, George Eliot uh, says that you know the heroine is usually an heiress a uh, peeress in her own right uh, you know she ha- there is an irresistible younger son of a marquis there are lovers and so on so these are the conventional tropes but uh, this is something that is uh, you know rejected by George Eliot very uh, you know strongly in this particular story and um, as uh, uh, one of uh, you know the critics points out that you know you uh, the story thwarts gender expectations not only reversing the roles of masculinity and femininity but also by pointing at the fluidity of anatomical boundaries here i think the word anatomical is also very interesting because there is so much of physiology that has gone in in the final blood transfusion and so on that uh, in this story eliot seems to employ uh, discourses and methods from medical and uh, you know uh, what are referred to as pseudo scientific practices to expose the limitations of her contemporary trends so uh, in a sense when we talk about the veil what we are saying is we are peeping at the forbidden to access knowledge that is not available knowledge that is considered to be a taboo the horrors in a sense of looking behind the veil here and uh, with this i think i'd also request uh, uh, professor prakash to share his views on you know a, a plot of this kind really speaking you see uh, uh, professor palnakwal i i always you know look at uh, a, a literary piece uh, in the context and uh, because you are raising a question about uh, the, the the enigma of uh, being a writer being uh, and the enigma of uh, being a character Uh, all that is exposed to a uh, to view of uh, the reader uh, today so i would place this story uh, uh, as as you rightly pointed out in the middle of the 19th century uh, uh, that is 1859 you say and uh, by that time you, uh, england has been under a woman's ru- uh, rule uh, Vict- uh, queen victoria has already uh, you know she is she is a queen and that has raised lots of doubts about people regarding women's rights uh, the attitude towards women and uh, george eliot would definitely be aware about the the the, the, em- the empress uh, she she also you know is a kind of a head of uh, the colonies that 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 uh, uh, in the meantime uh, have been occupied by uh, the british empire so all these things seem to be reflected in what you say because you know there nothing is certain now which angle the angle of the male the angle of the female the angle of uh, the 19th century as as you point, pointed out and uh, nobody has the answer then and then this medical thing you know whether a person is anatomical or or, or physiological also raises its its own pertinent issues because anatomy means that the, the way one appears now before uh, is a kind of body itself you you can count the bones you can count you can count the organs you can talk about their functions etc but the moment you talk about the functions they become physiology so physiology and anatomy and uh, Uh, there are there are new subjects there in in the in the 19th century and people are coming to terms with uh, these things also and is this the one of the early uh, writings of uh, the, the writer and uh, she is going into uh, all all these parameters of knowledge 
and she is raising basically questions. So it's not about answers, it's about questions and she is wondering all the time. She, he is, is wondering all the time. So uh, I think uh, uh, one has to keep one's fingers crossed in the 19th century context. But today we are aware that uh, some kind of science in the, in, in the 19th century was a bit dubious. And she took it up, you know, uh, in, in that novel which uh, we have discussed elsewhere, uh, uh, Middle March, where there, there, is, there is a man who is a hero uh, and uh, he is a doctor and he is a researcher, but he, is, uh, he falls into a trap and he can't do anything. So all these things, you know, either are uh, in, the, in the form of foreboding or in the sense of actually existing. And uh, your answers will be as good as mine. Yes. <coughs> so I completely agree that you know, placed against the context of the times, and especially with uh, you know the queen there uh, uh, at the head of uh, the country, and of um, uh, you know looking at uh, the lot, so many movements actually that come around this time in earlier uh, you know lectures, uh, especially on our series on feminism. We've discussed this uh, threadbare. So if you relate it to that and we see how over here George Eliot is very consciously rejecting the very, very, uh, the complete stereotyping of gender and of looking at, uh, you know, the, the male narrator, for instance, as the more aggressive one and the, the female protagonist in the story as somebody who would be effeminate. Now, this is completely reversed. And if one were to go along with uh, Latimer's point of view, one could almost also end up being critical of Bertha, but at the same time, this is Latimer's narrative, and one has to read between the lines. One has to also, uh, you know, there is no um, confirmation. It is one person's point of view, and I think George Eliot does that deliberately to uh, make the story also a space where there can be different points of view and uh, different ways of discussing, uh, you know, the whole issue. Uh, does she have the strategy to also tell the readers that it, it's, it's a woman's narrative but it is presented from the man's point of view? Uh, here, I, I, my reading is that she maintains a distance. It is not a woman's narrative that is from the mm. male point of view, but mm. it is a male narrative that the woman is writing. And is it convincing? Uh, it is only convincing as long as one looks at it within Latimer's point of view. Mm -hmm. But one has to move outside of it and to realize that, you know, there is, one is consciously reminded time mm -hmm. and again that this is what Latimer thinks. Does she remind the reader? Yes, she reminds the reader. Oh, very she good. She reminds mm -hmm. the reader through mm -hmm. Latimer yes. himself mm -hmm. and um, the kind of authorial, uh, the kind of authorial intervention we would have later. That is not there because this, we are still talking about the 1850s. But uh, one is through Latimer and his narrative, we are constantly reminded that uh, this is what it is. Clearly or only suggested? No, that uh, it's, it, it's written in the first person, so it's all clear. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's based on a kind of experiment that the writer is making. The well, experiment well, of presenting it through, through, through some other person. Uh, yes, to me it appears to be quite an experiment in terms of writing. And the range that, uh, you know, I think she has included here mm -hmm. is quite wide and quite vast. It's very difficult to pack so much in a story, but well, George Eliot has certainly done it. So, uh, for instance, you know, uh, as, as mentioned, that we look at uh, what are our normal expectations in a sense of being uh, a man or a woman, and that is completely uh, done away with here. So, um, if we actually uh, uh, look at, uh, you know, what Flint has to say, the lifted veil, uh, you know, provokes conjectures about the operations of fiction. So, you know, this is when George Eliot, she says, was developing theories concerning realism. And uh, so what is the kind of realism that George Eliot is trying to uh, project? You know, we've, uh, in a sense, we've moved away uh, from the, the, the early part of the 19th century to we moved into mid 19th century and things are changing. The concept of realism was also changing. So it was probably becoming and, uh, you know, being looked at as something that is more complex. So uh, one of the questions that is that, you know, if one could see, uh, foresee the actions, uh, would one act differently? And what is the sense of sympathy that is generated here? So in the context of, uh, you know, medical science, Victorian thinking and uh, so on, the tenets of realism, uh, there was a sense of looking at not just what was available in a sense to the uh, naked eye, but something beneath that. Mm 
which is where the idea of the whale becomes very very interesting that we are looking beyond what one can see and uh, this kind of realism is complex and uh, uh, I think specially coming from a, a woman writer it also uh, you know kind of uh, tells us that there is more to the woman's narrative than really speaking meets the eye a certain kind of interiority that needs to be understood and that needs to be tapped and this is quite different in a sense from the kind of realism you know which is termed naturalism that we see towards the end of the 19th century which is probably uh, rather stark and uh, you know uh, limited because it's more about what one can just see I think George Eliot is uh, coming up with a very different kind of realism uh, that's uh, you know complex and layered here so the story uh, hinges on uh, you know what if so or something like this were to happen so there is physiology there is craft and there is Eliot's familiarity with new readings in medical science because it is in 1859 that you know something like the physiology of common life uh, which is a book uh, you know really appears so uh, so which means that we enter the story in a sense through a very scientific and at the same time a pseudo scientific context you know one uh, of course is medical science and the other is uh, Latimer's clairvoyance and this demonstrates uh, George Eliot's knowledge of uh, you know contemporary medical debate and we see this work as also projecting the debate you know the debate that is there in a sense between the scientific method and um, a kind of reality that uh, you know uh, people were uh, exploring that goes beyond the real so this work is you know a deliberate questioning a challenging of this kind of desire really speaking of uh, you know the uh, the what lies in a sense in the imagination so she suggests uh, that you know rendering the invisible visible by imagination uh, and this is a quotation the invisible visible by imagination is from the story she suggests is far more valuable as a tool which means that one needs to and and from the point of view of gender this can be used well which is as mentioned that you know one has to see how uh, one really goes beyond the projected reality so the story is is rather complex for these reasons uh, one one point that you raised about in the beginning uh, raised about uh, this being a detective fiction so uh, what is that uh, you might enlighten us for a briefly so uh, you know what I mentioned what happens right at the end so mm. the the house help is not well and uh, she's about to die mm. but she keeps looking at Bertha in a very strange way with a lot of hatred mm. and uh, one doesn't know what why she's looking at Bertha like that mm. and uh, there has been no clairvoyance on that front either mm. so but it is this medical experiment that Charles conducts mm. that revives her momentarily mm. when the blood transfusion happens mm. for a few seconds after dying for a few seconds she gains life and so some kind of a crime is a crime is shaping up and, and, and that create, uh, arouses the curiosity in the, yes, in the reader yes because okay. the hatred with which so mm. what has happened is that Latimer is not very fond of this maid but mm. um, uh, uh, Bertha is very close to her house help and, uh, and she's there with her all the time one doesn't know why so you know a lot of uh, questions uh, remain unanswered but the whale in a sense to this particular there are many things happening but to this particular plot is lifted at the end mm -hmm. when uh, through Charles experiment mm -hmm. uh, she just gains life momentarily and she looks and she points towards Bertha and says that uh, you know she's full of hatred and how she wanted to actually poison her husband and she also says that you know the poison is lying in a specific cabinet mm -hmm. so uh, uh, this in a sense uh, you know gives a, a sense of finality it completes the episode uh, the killer, so to say, is revealed, and uh, but this is, as I said, who is the killer? I mean, projected killer mm -hmm. is Bertha. So oh, okay. she mm -hmm. wanted to poison Latimer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but this is only one aspect of mm -hmm. this uh, narrative because the entire narrative is through Latimer. But this might be a kind of um, uh, you know assertion of, of the woman in 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 that context. Uh, if she's killing, if she's poisoning someone, then she's taking a position. Certainly. Yes, and uh, which means uh, she uh, might have, as a character, might have sought the approbation of the author. 
and yes. the author is suggesting it, not clearly mentioning it. Uh, yes, and, and which is why I think it became important for George Eliot to also project a certain distance from this male narrator mm -hmm. because this is filtered through his mind, so to say. Oh, which means that it is connected with what you say about realism. Yes. She has to convince the reader, she has to convince herself and, and, she, and she has to convince the characters there. And she has to leave a, a space, uh, a kind of gap, a kind of vacuum she is what George Eliot also leaves us with. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know Bertha's side of the story. Mm -hmm. We only have one narrative. Mm -hmm. But it leads us to thinking about multiple possibilities. And the reader is made aware of the possibilities and the reader starts wondering uh, whether there is a crime being committed, whether it has been committed, all those things yes. and the answers are not given. Yes, the so, answers are not given. So, so it's, it's, it's a kind of, yes, it's a kind of crime fiction. Yes, yes. Uh, at, so at a very, very subtle early. level, yes. very early and very subtle level. Yes. I see. So, uh, you have covered so far the, the question of the uh, uh, short story form and uh, the characters and uh, you have also covered, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of the narrator uh, being, you know, in control of the story mostly, but then the narrator also is betraying some facts which go against him. Yes. So, viewers, uh, 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 Professor Nag, uh, Nagpal has already spread the net wide regarding the questions and uh, we are sure to uh, that, that she will take up uh, some of these uh, points further and uh, she will also add more information and, 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 and more analysis to the story in the following part of the discussion. Thank you.